Well, hey, everybody, how are we doing, all right? We doing good? Happy Memorial Day weekend. And we just want to right off the top here just thank all of those that have served in our military and for the great sacrifice as we remember our fallen heroes. Can we just do that right now? Can we thank them? Well, thanks for uh, showing up today, making Community Church part of your Memorial Day uh, weekend. If you're new, maybe you're in town visiting, maybe you're here on vacation uh, camping or something, and I want to be the first to apologize for the cold and rainy weather, but uh, hey, we're having fun in here. So um, uh, we uh, promise, uh, come on back, the sun will shine again, all right? But um, we have been in a new series around here. It's been quite fun. Uh, we're calling it God of the Underdogs. You guys enjoying this series? Come on in, be good. And we have been talking about these underdogs, these unlikely people that are unknown and unlikely to succeed, and then they go on to do something amazing and blow us all away. In the first week, we talked about Esther. Wasn't that a good story? Powerful story. Then last week, we talked about Nehemiah, and that was amazing as well. If you've missed the first couple of, of or one of the two of the first in this series, you can just go to our website, mycommunity.church, and you can watch those messages there on a demand. But today, we've got another really cool, powerful, amazing story to share with you. But before I dive into that, I want to show you this picture here. It's a little picture of, uh, of uh, one of my favorite places to go every summer up in the uh, Adirondack Mountains at Lake George. This is the first year that we went. Here's my kids. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe bring up the next picture. You can see them. My daughter Kate here. Now she's 18, moving to Brooklyn, going to go to school. My son David, he's bigger than her now. And then my two youngest boys, uh, Henry and Will. And uh, that year, uh, that first year, I, I believe it was the first year, uh, we went. Um, uh, all my kids are happy because every time I mention them in a sermon, they each get 10 bucks. So, I mean, it's just, they're like counting that money. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, um, but the first year we were there, uh, the, the Big Apple Circus was in town. And uh, here we are inside in the big top. And my favorite part of the circus, and we used to go to circuses, you know, before we were all woke. And... Um, Okay, a few more people laughed at that joke than the first service, so thank you, <laughs> being a little sarcastic. But my favorite part of the cir circus, really, uh, are the trapeze artists. How many just, it's mesmerizing, isn't it? These guys are swinging above the, you know, the crowd at the top of the big top and doing all these amazing aerial acrobatic moves. And, you know, just the scariest moment, right, is always when the one artist has to let go and reach out, and for that split second, I mean, they're flying in midair with no safety harness, and they have to trust that their partner is going to be there to catch them. Now, today, the story I want to tell you is about a guy, just an ordinary guy, and you might not even be familiar with the story, but I bet uh, you know his name, and his name is Noah. Noah. Now, here's my question for you. What do you do when God asks you to do something that makes no sense? What do you do when God asks you to do something that seems at face value completely crazy? That will force you to have to let go with no safety harness and just trust that God will be there to catch you. See, Noah, he tells us how. Noah tells us how to trust God to catch you, even when God asks you to do something that doesn't make any sense. And I just want you to know right on the top here that I've been praying for you been praying for entire families today to step out in faith and trust God to catch you, to make a bold decision, to do something here today that you didn't even plan on doing when you walk through those doors, to make a decision to say yes to Jesus, yes to his grace, yes to his forgiveness, yes to his salvation, and then to declare publicly that decision 
to say yes to Jesus as your Savior and your friend by being water baptized. Today, I'm talking about you came here dry, you're going to go home wet. I know it's crazy. I know it might not make sense, but just hear me out. So, Noah's story, it's told in the first book in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in chapters 6, 7, and 8. Earlier in that book, we learn how God created all creation. The crowning act of his creation was mankind, our first parents, Adam and Eve. And he instilled within them, you know, this desire to walk with them, to be in relationship between the creator and the creation. But also he put inside of them, inside of humanity, his creation, uh, this free will that we can choose to either walk with God, accept his love, or to reject God and walk away from God. Because love isn't really love unless it's a decision. Un- un- unless it's a choice of your free will to love. It's not really love. And so God puts that inside of us as his creation. And everything's going great at first. Until Adam and Eve use their freedom, use their free will to walk away from God and deliberately disobey God. That act initiated a free fall for humanity. And it's led to all kinds of dark, destructive behavior that has absolutely broken the heart of God. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, uh, archaeologists believe that there was about a million people that were alive on the face of the earth. So Noah is literally one in a million. And he's just like an ordinary, everyday, average guy. He's one, though, in a million. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, it, it begins us to tell and unfold this guy's story. And it goes like this. The Lord observed that the extent of human wickedness on the earth, he saw that every thought Everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. It was bad. So the Lord was sorry he had ever even made them and put them on the earth. And it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Like a a parent of a rebellious child. God looks at his creation as they walk away from him, as they snub their nose, as they stiff arm him, and they walk away. And it broke God's heart. But the story goes on and says this. But Noah, in the next verse, we rehearse this. (laughs) But Noah... You guys are doing great up there. I love you. (laughs) But Noah found favor with the Lord. He found what? He found, let's say it, favor. You know what that word literally translates from Hebrew? It literally translates. Here's what it means. When an extraordinary person gives an ordinary person, an underdog, like you and me, a second chance. God was giving Noah and his family, a second chance, a second chance to be saved from the destruction of the world. And now Noah, Noah, you know, he was just a guy in a long list of guys. Let me tell you a little bit about Noah and about his family. Noah, his father, his name was Lamech. His grandfather, you might have heard of this guy, he's known as the oldest man that's ever lived, over a thousand years old. His name was Methuselah. Noah's great-grandfather was named Enoch. And when the Bible describes his great-grandfather, it just simply describes him as a man who walked with God. In fact, when the Bible describes Noah, we'll go to the next verse, it describes Noah in a very similar way. And in the next verse, 
Come on, work with me. There we go. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. How cool would it be when God wants to describe you that he would say this? She walked faithfully with God. He walked faithfully with God. What a great description of your life if you had to summarize your life. And when it says he was blameless, it didn't mean he was perfect because nobody's perfect. You read his story. Sometimes he drank too much. It just meant that he was doing the best that he could to walk with God. And as he walked with God, he found favor with God. And what do you do when God asks you to do something that just doesn't seem to make any sense? Not only to others who are looking at you, but even to yourself. What do you do when God asks you to do something that just seems so crazy and it just doesn't make any sense? Well, Noah kind of puts on a clinic here. And you do these three things. The first thing you do, number one, is you obey God even when you don't understand it. You obey God even when you don't understand it. Now, at the time that this story in Noah's life takes place, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but the Bible says he was 500 years old. He's probably going through a midlife crisis. You know, and, and, and God says to him in Genesis chapter 6, Noah, I want you to build a boat, a really big boat for you and your family because it's going to flood. Now, from a human perspective, this is just bananas. It makes no sense. Noah, um, the closest body of water to him was like 500 miles away. It was the Mediterranean Sea. Even if he could build a big boat, how could he ever get it 500 miles from where he lived, which was in the middle of a desert, to the water? And we don't even have record from the biblical account that Noah had ever even seen a boat. He didn't even know what maybe one looked like. And Genesis 2 further indicates that at this time, in the history of the world, it had never even rained. I mean, rain had never happened before. That's why many scientists today believe the people lived much longer back then because it never rained before. And, you know, they also didn't have monosodium you know, glutamate as well. I mean, it was just, uh, maybe that was it. But the earth, the Bible says, was, was watered from a dew in the morning that came up from the ground, so it never even rained. So the entire ecosystem, the atmosphere, was completely different to the, the rain that we're experiencing today on Memorial Day weekend here in the Poconos. So God gives him specific instructions to build this boat, this big boat. It was called the Ark, which translates the palace, which I kind of think is funny. Um... God gave him, you know, his material list. The boat was to be made from gopher wood. It was to be tarred inside and out. It was to have three levels, a lower, middle, and upper uh, deck. It was to be 450 feet long. That's a football field and a half long. It was to be 45 feet high. That's four and a half story building high. It was to be 75 feet wide. That's, a, that's the width of a six-lane super highway. If you do the math on this thing, it's massive. It could have held up to 2,500, I'm sorry, 522 railroad boxcars. I mean, it could have hauled 125,000 sheep. That is a lot of sheep doo-doo. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big boat. And God said, I want you and your family to get on this boat and every two kind of every living animal, and I'm going to cleanse the world from all its corruption and violence and depravity and sin. I'm going to do all this with a flood. I'm going to start over, Noah. It's going to be a clean slate, a new beginning. And all of this is just so stinking crazy. It makes no sense. In fact, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, 
It says this. It was by faith. It was by what? Let's say it together. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He, let's say it together, obeyed God. What did he do? He obeyed God who warned him about the things that had never happened before. This is why it was so crazy because all this stuff had never happened before. They had no context of rain, of flooding. But notice it says, by faith, he obeyed. You see, faith and obedience go together. Like hand in glove, they go together. And just for a minute, would you just imagine, like what if God showed up in your life this weekend? You wake up tomorrow morning, God says, hey, I really don't like how things are going in the world. This pandemic, you know, the crisis in the Middle East, all this other stuff, the injustice, the racism, the division, the sin, I'm tired of it all. So here's what I want you to do. Steve, Mary, I want you to build like a big boat, like a cruise ship. I want you to get you and your whole family on the boat, and then I'm going to bring two of every kind of living animal onto the boat, and I want to save you and your entire family. Would you have the guts to believe God? I mean, how crazy would that be? I mean, it's just... It's just nuts if you really think about it. That makes no sense. And what if God would come to you and say, you know that person that hurt you? Betrayed you, lied about you, slandered your name, caused you pain, broke their promises? Yeah, I want you to pray for them. I want you to love them. I want you to forgive them. That makes no sense. I mean, what if God would say to you, you know all that stuff you worry about? The job, the business, the money, how you're going to make the next rent, the mortgage, the diagnosis that you got from the doctor, all that stuff that you worry about, your kids and your grandkids, all that kind of stuff that's going, I don't want you to worry about that. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worries in itself. But it still makes no sense. I mean, what if God would say to you, hey, I don't want you to marry her. I don't want you to marry him because they don't share your religious values and your convictions. And I want you to share the most important values of your life with the most important person in your life. And I want you to be on the same page. And you would say, but dang, God, he's so hot. Dude, she is so cute. Have you seen her profile? I mean, God, come on. Seriously? And it makes no sense. And when God says to you, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you decide to say yes to his grace and forgiveness in your life, to be your forgiver and your friend, and when God says to you, I want you to declare publicly your faith in Jesus Christ through water baptism at the first opportunity you have to do so. It makes no sense. But yet Noah obeyed God even though it didn't make sense. And guess how long it took for him to build this boat? 120 years. That is a stinking long time to build this boat, 120 years. Now, if I was Noah, at about, you know, year 75, you know, I would have been like 575 years old at the time. I'd be like, God, come on, seriously? I've been working on this. I, my knees hurt, my hands hurt, my back hurts. You know, there's not a cloud in the sky, you know, we... You know, what, you know, God, I think I just don't want to build this stupid boat anymore. I think I'm done. I want to retire. You know, stick a fork in me. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm sure that had to have gone through his mind at one moment or another. Have you ever noticed that your timing and God's timing are not always the same? Have you ever noticed? Because don't we just want things now? I mean, after 24 years to Becca, 
when she says, I'll be ready in 10 minutes. That means something completely different to her <laughs> than it means to me. And if you really know us, you'd know the truth that it's really the other way around. <laughs> but Noah waited 120 years. I love this quote from Philip Yancey. Listen to this. Faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Man, let me read that again. Let it just kind of wash over you. Faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Some of you are going through some stuff in your life right now. It makes no sense. I get it. It makes no sense. But faith is trusting in advance, in advance what will only make sense when you look back one day, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, in Noah's case, 120 years from now, <laughs> and it will one day make sense. So I'm sure going through this process, it wasn't easy for Noah. I'm sure he had some sleepless nights. I'm sure he had to pop a few tums. I'm sure it was a struggle. Even when God warned him about the things that he just didn't understand that had never happened before, he obeyed God even when he didn't understand it. Here's the second thing he did. Listen to this. You ignore your detractors and you just keep moving forward. When God asks you to step out in faith, I'm just telling you, you will be criticized. When God asks you to do things that don't make sense to you or to other people around you, there will be haters. There will be people throwing shade and saying all kinds of nasty stuff about you. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, wherever else you hang out in your digital space, they're going to just say things that are going to criticize you. And for 120 years, Noah was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was made fun of. You know, it was hashtag Noah's an idiot. It was all over. It went viral. Everybody knew about what was happening. This guy, yeah, he's building a boat. He said it's going to rain, whatever that means, and it's going to flood, whatever that means. And he says you better come on board the boat, whatever that means means he's lost his mind. Rain, what is he? We live in a desert. We have never seen a cloud. It was blue sky every single day. It was sunshine. I mean, it was, you know, tank tops. Sun's out, gun's out, let's go. Every single day. It had never Rain, and he was ridiculed, and he was made fun of. He was the laughing stock of the world. Friends, I'm just telling you, whenever you step out in faith to trust God and obey the voice of God in your life, it's not going to make sense to other people, and you will catch flack for it. In fact, I would tell you, if you are not catching flack for your version of Christianity, you've got the wrong version of Christianity. That we are to be called out. That we are to be different. We don't swim in the stream of contemporary culture. No, we swim upstream. There should be something different and noticeable. I'm not talking about, you know, you're not like a jerk. You're not like condemning people. But I'm talking about there should be a joy inside of you. When you're going through hell and your whole world has fallen hard, apart, when your heart has been broken, when there's times in your life that you think you will never recover from, but yet you have this abiding peace. You have this joy and your friends look at you and like, this makes no sense. There's something about him. There's something about her. When I watch them go through this, there is, I don't know what it is. Well, we know what it is. It's Jesus. Come on. It's Jesus. It's Jesus, and it's his spirit, and it's his message. But there should be something about you. When everybody else cheats on their, on their, on their sales reports, and they pad the numbers, 
and you refuse to play that game, that you choose to walk in character and integrity, and instead of going where everybody else goes and looks at what everybody else looks at and spends their money on what everybody else spends their money on, that there's something different inside of you, and just with a sweet spirit, like not with like, I'm better than you, I'm holier than you. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to run the race that God has put before me. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you because this is just a better way to live. This is a better way to go through life. And, and, and there's going to be haters and there's going to be people that just don't understand. I mean, there are a large number of people who are part of this church that give a very large percentage of their household income to fund this local church that is pushing back the powers of darkness in the Poconos so that the power of Jesus and his name can be made known. And our accountants, listen, our accountants think we're nuts. If your accountant has never looked at your tax return and seen how much money, the percentage that you give away, and never said, are you sure? Like, this is really what you want to do? If your accountant has never said that to you, I would go back and look at where you're giving us. Because if you do it God's way, it should make that accountant raise their little eyebrow and say, wait, whoa, nobody gives that much to charity. There must be something wrong. There's a, a large number of people in this church that give up a week of their vacation every year to go serve in an orphanage in Guatemala or in Haiti, these people that we support around the world. There's, there are large people that do that. And to our friends, they're like, wait, wait, you get two weeks of vacation, you're going to use one of them? You're going to pay for this out of your own money. You're going to use your vacation time to go do this. And you're going to sleep on the floor of some, you know, orphanage in a third world. And that's what you're going to do with your week of vacation? Yeah, they think that's nuts. There's a large number of us that show up at this church every Sunday morning even when it's raining, every Sunday morning, when the rain is falling, when the sleet is falling, when it's, we're like the mailman around here, man. We're, we're, we just show up and we serve. We serve in the parking lot. We serve in kids. We serve in you know, hospitality, first impressions. We serve in worship and tech. We, we, just, we just serve. And, and our, our friends think, wait, you get two days off a week and you're going to use one of those days to go to church on Sunday. To serve, not just to sit around and have other people serve you so that you can serve other people and not get paid for it, you're nuts. Listen, when you obey God and you step out in faith, there are going to be people that are going to just criticize, and that's okay. To me, that means you're doing something right. I mean, I think your neighbors know where you are today. Instead of, you know, trying to do a barbecue, they, they, they watched you pull out of your driveway this morning and go to church. And I just know there's times. I mean, Noah had three sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, the three boys from which all cultures now have descended. It's a really interesting study. You ought to do it sometime. They were all three different colors. One was white, one was black, and one was... Mulatto. <laughs> and how did they have three different colored children? Because Mr. and Mrs. Noah were an interracial couple. That's how. And all the races of the earth came from them. And I'm sure when these three boys are up there working on that boat, there had to become a time where they would whisper, I think dad's lost it. <laughs> he's blowing our whole inheritance on this stinking boat. I, I think he's got early signs of dementia. We should have him check that out. We need to have him look. I mean, I'm just telling you, these words of detraction, they could come from everywhere. But if you're going to be an underdog type person, a Noah type person, you have to ignore the detractors and keep moving forward. You ever heard the story about the grandfather and his grandson? They were going into town. He had a donkey, so he, he set his grandson on the donkey, and they started going into town. Not too long, and the 
ran into a group of people, and they started Chris. Look at this kid. What a jerk this kid is. Making this old man walk while he rides on the back of a donkey. Well, they heard this. So the grandfather gets his grandson off the donkey, and he gets on the donkey. They walk on down the road a little further, and another group of people come. Look at this. Look at this old man. What kind of guy is he making his grandson walk, this little kid walk in the sun while he rides on top of the donkey? Well, they heard that criticism, so he got the, off the donkey, and, and they're walking just together next to the donkey and ran into another group of people, and they looked at them and said, look at these idiots. They got a perfectly good donkey there, and neither of them is riding on it. So then they both got on the donkey. And they come along down the road, and another group of people said, look at these guys, how they're abusing this poor donkey. Who do they think they are? Well, the last time that grandfather and his son were seen or ever heard of, they were carrying the donkey down the road. Hashtag dumb preacher joke. But the point is, no matter what you do, Somebody's going to criticize you for it. And aren't you glad? Hey, come on. We have not been called to live to please this world. We have been called to please our God. I care more about what God thinks than what they think. I care about more about what God says than what the haters say. I, I want to live to hear my Father in heaven say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Who's with me? Well done. So listen, you can expect some criticism. What do you do when God asks you to do something that looks crazy? Well, underdogs, obey God even when you don't understand it. Underdogs, you ignore detractors and you keep moving forward. And third and finally, you maximize opportunities while doors are open. You seize the day. You maximize the opportunity while the door is still open. And after all the work, after all the doubt, after 120 years of criticism, Genesis chapter 7 tells us this. When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with all your family. You know, that word go in Hebrew literally translates come. Come. When everything was ready, God said to Noah, he extends this gracious invitation, come, everything's ready. Come, the door is open. Come into a place of safety, the door is open. Come into a place of security, the door is open. I provided a, a path for your salvation. Come, everything is ready. And for 120 years, God extended this gracious invitation, not only to Noah, but to everyone. For 120 years, God's come. I've made a way. Come. I want to save you. Come. I love how it says, in him and his entire family, they went into the boat. I love that. You know, in the New Testament, we read uh, uh, about you know, entire families coming to faith in Jesus Christ, making a decision to follow him. Acts chapter 16, the uh, Philippian jailer, he believed and he and his entire family were baptized together the moment they believed, even though it was in the middle of the night. Often here, it's not uncommon to see entire families be baptized together. And God says to Noah, come Noah, you and the entire family, while the door is still open, while there's still opportunity, come. You know, I once heard a sermon. Uh, it was entitled, Come. It was based off this word, which actually is go in English, but Hebrew is come. That word, come, is used over 1,100 times in the Old Testament alone. That's, that's God. He's just inviting. Come. I've made a way. Come. I love you. You know, Jesus said in the book of Relation, uh, Revelation, Anyone who is thirsty, come. Now that gracious invitation, it was extended to the entire world for 120 years. 
but no one responded, not a single person other than Noah and his immediate family for 120 years. You know, I've often wondered what it would be like to preach for 20 years and have no one respond to an invitation. But then miraculously, God brings all of the animals two by two onto the boat. And then Noah and his family, eight of them in all, Noah and his wife, his three boys and their wives, eight of them in all, they get onto the boat. And the door was shut behind them. You know what happened on the first day? Nothing. Didn't rain a drop. Second day, no rain. Third day, no rain. They continued to ridicule them, to make fun of them. Post on Instagram with them on the board and the door being shut. I mean, they just continue. Day four, no rain. Day five, no rain. Day six, around evening, after no rain. All of a sudden, for the first time, they looked up to the sky and they saw what they'd never seen before. Clouds began to gather and the world became dark for the first time. The wind began to pick up and blow and leaves were beginning to blow violently in this breeze that they had not felt before. And then around midnight, for the first time, they heard the thunder roll. They saw the lightning, shafts of light crackling. Fear gripped their heart. And it began to rain. They clamored at the door. Open up, open up, open up. But my friend, it was too late. The door had been shut. By morning, it rained all night. The water was ankle high. By the next morning, it was waist deep. By the next day, the floodwaters, after 40 days of raining, lifted that boat up off the ground. And the entire world went eerily silent. You know, if Noah could stand here and share this account from his, you know, first account experience, I think when Noah would talk about this, I think it bring tears to his eyes because this was real it was raw people died his friends died his extended family members died his cousins friends that he'd known his whole life neighbors this was raw this was real a million people perished I think Noah would say you better maximize the opportunity while the door is still open because the reality, my friend, is eventually for every single one of us, that door will be shut. In the New Testament, Jesus, he compares the story of Noah, this is Jesus, he compares the story of Noah to his second coming. And just so we're clear, you're hearing from a guy that believes in the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming back just like he said he would. He will return. There will come a day when the skies above us will be split wide open and the ark trumpet of the the Lord shall sound and Jesus shall return just the way he left. And Jesus uses the story of Noah to explain this and to offer a warning to all who would hear it. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this in Luke 17, when the Son of Man returns, when he says, when I come back, because he said, listen, I'm coming back. And I want you to know, Jesus keeps his promise. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't change his mind. Jesus is faithful to do what he says he will do in your life and in this world. And he says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. And the flood came and destroyed them 
all. Jesus is like, gang, listen, I'm coming back. So make sure you seize the opportunity to walk through the open door while you still have the chance. God says to you, come. He offers you an invitation. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Come. Are you tired of in the spin cycle of sin, struggling with the same destructive cycles in your life? He says, come. Are you thirsty? Come. Are you hungry? Come. Taste and see that the Lord, He is good. He extends to you an invitation today. I believe God is looking for people right here, right now, in this room, on the other side of that camera that would put their faith in Jesus Christ and turn from their past and their mistakes and all of their pain and even in their success that has come with an emptiness because success never delivers on what it promises. And I believe God is looking for people today who would walk through that door of opportunity, walk through that door of grace while it's still open. I believe that God is looking for people who will obey him even when it doesn't make sense, who keep moving forward even despite the detractors in their way, that God was looking for people who will maximize the opportunities while the doors are open. And for some of you, that opportunity today is to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to say yes to Jesus, to say yes to his grace, Say yes to his love. He's for you. He's not against you. Say yes to his, his peace in your life. And then to declare your faith by being water baptized today. You know, Peter, who followed Jesus, was the pillar of the New Testament church. He compared baptism, water baptism, to Noah's story. Listen to what he says. He says this, God waited patiently 120 years in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. It, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. They were saved, wait, through, listen, through the water. How would they say through the water? This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from your body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you, the water saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yet your faith in Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, died, and three days later he rose from the dead, he resurrected from the dead, that's what saves you. The very water that destroyed the earth was the very water that lifted the ark and saved all that were inside. It's a beautiful picture. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit gave that to Peter, and he wrote it down to remind us the importance of baptism. So if you think about it, Jesus is offering you today an opportunity to walk through the open door. The baptism, it symbolizes the death and burial of Jesus Christ as you're lowered into the water. You're saying, I'm dead to my old life. I'm dead to old habits. I'm dead to that nasty, messed up, destructive thought patterns that have stolen so much joy from my life. What I think about myself and that old identity that I'm worthless. I'm saying I'm dead to all that. And as you come up out of, just like Jesus died, and as he came up out of the grave, you come up out of that watery symbolic grave. Oh, I'm new in Christ. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. Because whoever finds Jesus finds life. And he offers you life today offers you life today. So before we close, I want to tell you a story about a couple friends. I got their picture here. These are my friends London and her brother Lane. Uh, London kind of stumbled into this church back in 2016. Quite honestly, and she'd tell you, her life was kind of a mess. Just like so many of us when we stumbled through those doors. She became close friends with my wife, Becca. Started to encourage her and disciple her, tell her about Jesus. And one day, London decided to accept Jesus as their savior, and I had the honor of baptizing her. Well, London, finding this new freedom and this new love, it changed her life. She had to tell her brother, Lane, about Jesus. So then Lane 
comes to church with her one day. This guy could light up a room. I mean, he is the center of the party. I mean, he's wonderful. I mean, just the, the, the life and love in this guy. And he came, you know, kind of just full of questions, full of doubt, full of just, he, he was not following Jesus. He wasn't like a church guy got plugged into a small group here and I was talking to their small his small group leader uh, last night on the phone and and we were just talking about Lane and how he would just come every week with a list of questions and they just loved and accepted Lane and all the questions he had and all the doubts and all the fears but one day Lane found the answer and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior and he became a follower of Jesus but that wasn't enough for Lane. He started to tell all his friends. He started to tell all his family. Lane brought his mom, Tina, to church. She found faith. She uh, committed to become a follower of Jesus. And I had the privilege of baptizing Lane and his mother on the same day. I want to show you that baptism. days ago, Lane was in a fatal car accident. He's only 30 years old. And um, the family called me and asked me to come and do the funeral, which of course I said yes. And um, so two nights ago, Beck and I went down to the Bangor funeral home and hundreds of people showed up. They love Lane. And Lane loved them and celebrated his life together. Many of them are actually here today. Thank you for coming. We love you and we've been praying for you as a church. And that was a tough one. Life seems to be taken so short, only 30 years old. And, um, but I take solace in this, that I was able to say with great assurance and confidence that, that Lane made the best decision of his life and he walked through the door of opportunity when he still had the chance. In fact, the family wrote me this beautiful little note. They said, Pastor Dave, I, I don't think that I could ever express how much it means to my family that you were with us on the hardest day of our lives. Lane was lost when he came to community church. He listened to you preach. You helped change his life. You helped bring him to faith. And that is the only thing that can bring us comfort in our pain. Thank you for speaking today. It was incredibly special to us all. I want you to know as followers of Jesus, it's hard to say goodbye. And we grieve. But we don't grieve like the rest of the world that has no hope. We have the hope of heaven that we will see Lane again and all of those that are our friends and loved ones. I think of my friend right here who lost his father this week. and I, I, We have the hope of heaven today but you have to walk through the door of opportunity. If Lane could be here today, a 30-year-old guy lost his life tragically, he would say to you, don't wait, don't delay. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Life is fragile. It's here one moment, it's gone the next. Say yes today. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Say yes today. So what's pr to prevent you from saying yes to Jesus today? To walk through this door of opportunity, to be water baptized. We're, we're set up. We have everything you need. And some of you still don't believe me. I'm serious. 
Well, I didn't come prepared. It's okay. We got clothes, we got towels, we got hair dryers, we got undergarments, we got flip flops, we got t shirts, we got everything you stinking need. We got you covered, baby. We got you covered. Well, I, I haven't had a baptism class yet. And I would say, you just had one. This is your class right here. You would say, well, I came with some friends today, and I don't, I don't want to make them wait around. And, you know, listen, you came with friends today from Community Church. They'll wait around as long as you want, and they will celebrate their faces off for you if you stand and make a decision to accept Christ. Or some of you are thinking, well, quite honestly, Pastor, I'm having a really good hair day. You know, it's just, you know, it's kind of curly, all the moisture. It's just really good. I don't want to mess it up. Well, come on, that's just pride. Well, I wasn't planning on doing this today. Well, God had it circled on his calendar for you. Yeah. He planned it. You might not have. But what about COVID? Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. There's no science that suggests that you can get COVID through water. Otherwise, Kalahari would be closed down. Aquatobi would be closed down. We'd have COVID all over the mountain. Meanwhile, they're packed. So it's safe. It's sanitized. But what about my kids? You know, what if it's running late and they... Listen, I checked with the team. They said, you can come pick them up next week. It's okay. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, you might say, I'm just visiting today and I'm not sure I want to become a member of this church. To which I would say, well, we're not sure. We want you to become a member of this church, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> In all seriousness... We are not baptizing you into this church. We're baptizing you into Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and his family. And you might say, well, I really want my family to be here. To which I say, well, your real family, your real family that's going to last forever is your spiritual family. Your spiritual family will outlast your earthly family. So your real family's here. But we're going to have photographers back here. We're going to capture this moment. You can share it with them a thousand times. And most importantly, your heavenly father is here. And he's going to be looking down over the balcony of heaven just as he looked down over his own son baptism. And he's going to say, there's my girl. There's my son. There's my boy. In whom I am well pleased. Good job. Good job. So we're all prepared today. And uh, we got our little Jesus jacuzzi. It's all set up. It's nice and warm. It's clean. It's right there in the lobby. And um, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if you want to stand today in honor of the one who hung on the cross for you and then rose from the dead three days later and declare your faith in him and be publicly water baptized today, I want to give you the opportunity to do that have your sins forgiven there's no reason you should leave this place today without hope because there's hope in Jesus there's no reason you should leave this place today feeling defeated because Jesus rose from the dead and he defeated hell and the grave there's no reason you should walk out of this place today without the assurance of your salvation because Jesus died but three days later he rose from the dead for you and if you came here today already planning to be baptized when I count to three I want you to stand too but if you didn't come here today planning to be baptized I get it this seems crazy but if I'm going to be out of my mind I want to be out of my mind for Jesus and I know I'm asking you to do something that on paper it makes no sense but to your heavenly father it, this day makes no perfect sense I'm looking for some men in here some men like Lane that would be willing to be just a little bit bold look for some men in here that would grab their wife's hand their son's hand their daughter's hand and say you know what that's for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord God's looking for some women in here. You've been hurt. 
been abandoned, been abused. And he's just saying, come. I got a whole family here. It's going to love you and accept you and help you find healing and grace. Looking for some young people in here. What if people find out at school, I got baptized? Some of you think, what if, what if people at work find out, I got baptized? Well, so what? I know it's not popular to follow Jesus today, but I'm not going to live my life to please people. I'm going to live my life to please my Heavenly Father. So I'm going to count to three, and on three, I'm going to ask you, if you want to stand today, declare your faith in Jesus, be baptized. Pray that you would take that step. It's the most important step. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. So one, to obey God. Oh, bless her heart. She's just... Even if you don't understand it, you're going to obey God. Two, you're not going to care what anybody else thinks or says. And three, you're going to maximize the opportunity. You're going to walk through it. Come on. <laughs> All right. Come on. Oh, come on. Look. Dang it. All right. I wasn't planning on baptizing personally today, but I got some work to do. So if you're going to hang out and wait for me, some of my best friends in the world just said yes to this. And some of my... He loves you so much, honey. Can I just pray for you? And even if you didn't stand yet, even when we pray, just stand up. Come on, let's do this. What are you waiting for? Come on. There you go. There you go. There you go. Come on. There you go. Come on. Keep standing. You want to do this? Let's do this. Let's get it done. Come on. Come on. There we go. Come on, bro. I see you. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There we go. Dang. We're going to have to push off the barbecue for a few minutes, all right? But let me pray. Here we go. Ready? Thank you, Jesus, for these people that are standing here today. They've expressed Noah-like faith. And they've walked through this door of opportunity today. I know it seems crazy. But today they stand in honor of you that hung on the cross for them in their sin and shame. And they stand and they say yes to you, yes to your grace, yes to your forgiveness, yes to the hope of heaven, yes to seeing their loved ones who died in faith in Christ again, yes to the strength that you're going to give to them to walk through the rest of their life. We rejoice today. We celebrate with the angels in heaven today. We celebrate with them today. We now call them brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. And for his sake, amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate them. What? Come on. Come on, church. We can do better than that. Are we through? Come on. Come on! Angels in heaven rejoice! But one that is lost is then found. Come on, this is amazing! Amazing! All right. All right, all right. Okay, okay. Here's what we want to do. Everybody who's not getting baptized, sit down. Everybody else, stay standing. You already stood. We all saw you. We're going to all see you get wet here in a minute. Can we open the doors in the back?
And as these guys go back, the team's going to direct you. You know, oh, what about my wallet, my stuff? It's okay. We got security. They carry guns. Your stuff is safe. They don't carry guns. Your stuff will be safe. We got people that watch it. So as they walk out, come on, church. Let's just celebrate our faces off one more time. Come on. Go ahead right out and walk out to the back. All of you, come on. Come on, it's a big day. It's a big walk. It's a big walk. Come on. Come on, come on, keep it going for him. Come on, it's a big walk. All of heaven rejoices today. All of angels rejoice today. Come on, they're still going. Still saying yes to Jesus today. Come on, keep it going for him. Keep it going. Oy, oy, oy. That was like over 50 people that just responded. Come on. Can we one more time give him praise? Come on, he is good. All right, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do real quick. All right. All right. Bring it out, bring it out. Here's what I want you to do. I know you got plans. I'm just saying, maybe just push them off for another 10 minutes because this is what we live for around here. This is what this is all about. And so people have just made the biggest decision in their life. They've literally gone from death to life. When you walk through that door, it's a walk from death to life. It's going to seal the deal. They're going to go to heaven. It's amazing. So I want us all, we got cake, we got drinks, whatever. I want us to get 10 deep around that tank. And I want you, if your friend came with, just push your way up to the front and you videotape them and you take their picture. We got a photographer out there. And every time somebody comes up out of that water, I want you to scream your face off. I want you to clap. I want you to cheer. I don't want a little golf PGA clap. I want Brooklyn, Queens, Puerto Rican, African American, crazy white guy clap and scream and shout and let's celebrate our faces off. I cannot think of a better way to spend Memorial Day weekend than what we're about ready to do. I got to go find some shorts. I got to go find a shirt because a bunch of my friends just got saved. I've been praying for years on this. This is a special moment. So I'll see you out there. God bless you. Come back next week. I'll see you next week.